my dear sweet friends. So I had to run over to my weird filming setup um, <laughs> before I could like fully get over the rush of emotions that just happened. I am challenging myself this holiday season. Also, hello, welcome to the channel. Hi, my name is Carrie. Thank you for being here. We're gonna read a ton of Christmas romance books. I have been struggling with like just not easily slipping into a book like I usually do and usually romances kind of shake me up and I can just read them in like one night and I just remember that I love to read, right? It's just like easy to digest, love me a rom-com, very happy for this journey that I have taken. I was like not a rom-com girly and then I was enlightened. So the reason why I am a little bit frantic looking is because I came up with my list and the first one I put down, I just Googled like Christmas romance books. And one of the first ones I saw, I was like, oh my gosh, Tessa Bailey, yeah, I love her. I loved, what was it called? Romancing the Duke. And then as I'm like slowly getting my camera out, ready to like film this intro, I was like, that was Tessa Dare. And so if I am correct, Tessa Bailey is the author of it happened once. Okay, good, 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 good. Phew. At first I was thinking she was, who wrote The Hating Game? Because The Hating Game was one of the first rom-coms I read before I really read rom-coms and it kind of traumatized me. But okay, Tessa Bailey wrote It Happened One Summer and Hook, Line, and Sinker, which I have read and I have been okay with. Okay, I'm less, I'm less crazy now. Great. We're just gonna dive in. I'm filming a Christmas in Korea video for my main channel, so we're actually heading out right now to a cookie cafe um, that is so Christmased out. I was there this weekend and I just sat there for hours staring at their Christmas tree. They were playing Christmas music. I was just feeling it. So what better place to start my Christmas reading experiment. So I probably, I might not talk as much because I will not be squealing about a book in the middle of a cafe. I am not there yet, um, but I will come home and update you, okay? Okay, see you. I'm actually dying over this book. Um, Tessa Bailey can just write really funny, like overreactive scenes. And so her characters are just so funny and I'm having a good time. I'm about 20% through and I'm gonna have dinner. Kurt just got home from work um, and then I'm gonna dive back into it, but so good, so jolly. I'll tell you what it's about when I get home. Hi, we've made it back home. Welcome. Where am I? Hold on. Okay, so yes, I started with Wreck the Halls, Tessa Bailey. Let me see how far am I? I'm exactly 20% of the way through. I'm on page 53, chapter 5. What's going on? So yes, yes, his name is Beat. We're not going to talk about it. Anyway, the prologue starts off with these two kids meeting and the reason that they're meeting is because they are both being interviewed for something and that something is that their mothers used to be in a band in the 90s called Steelbirds that is just so incredibly popular but they broke up in the 90s right before both of them were born and so they're constantly like in the limelight as these kind of celebrities by relation and they've only met once during that interview but it like rocked both of their worlds and so now we found out that beat is in trouble he's being blackmailed and whatever it is is going to ruin his mother's reputation and like and so he needs to come up with eight hundred thousand dollars to silence this 
blackmailer once again. This is like the fifth time he's had to pay this guy, which I feel like you would learn it's just, it's never gonna stop, right? So he decides, even though he has put it off for so long, he finally responded to one of the requests to do a kind of reality TV show about the band. He's going to like try and make the reunion happen because apparently their song went viral or something 30 years later and so now like the call for the reunion is like they gotta strike while the iron's hot right so he gets offered a million dollars to do this reality show but he's not gonna do it without melody our main girl without her consent because both of them if this gets hot again they're both gonna be in the tabloids which they were not very nice to Melody um, when she was a teen. So he wants her permission. And that's all I've read so far. I am terrified of the hints dropped about his nocturnal tendencies. I'm scared because Tessa has pretty, pretty horrific dirty talk smutty scenes. I'm not sure what I'm getting myself into, but so far, like I said, like Tessa's just really good at making these really dramatic over the top characters that are just so funny. So like when they met, the way that she described like the girl is 16 and so she's just like, I'm sweating everywhere. Like my feet are sweaty. <laughs> the back of my knees are sweaty. Like just, I don't know, something about her writing. Like it, it really makes me giggle. I was giggling in the cafe. So um, I'm gonna continue that and we'll see, but they have until Christmas to get the band back together and make the one million dollars and let's see will they pull off a Christmas miracle or will it just be about the friends you make along the way who knows but I'm interested I think I'm gonna try and finish it tonight it's oh oh my god it's only six o'clock it is dark outside I hate winter um I thought it was like nine so yeah I'm, I'm absolutely finishing this tonight and I will check in with you uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning to start our next Christmas adventure. So, all right, catch you later. I'm gonna go hang out, see what uh, Beat and Melody are up to, okay? Bye. I've definitely figured out what the nocturnal tendencies are. He's talking about the gym, but you know. Oh no. Guys, I wanna get off this ride. <laughs> There's also like a sub romance with the cameraman and the producer of the show, which is just so cute. She called him an ogre, but he's like a Shrek kind. <laughs> Tessa Bailey just writes the craziest, like just the worst smut. I, I can't. She, her characters always, like specifically the male characters, completely flip a switch and like become different people. And it is bizarre. And I just can't read it without laughing. <laughs> okay, we are 55% of the way through and this has just devolved into absolute ridiculousness. The smut is horrific. And now... There are Santas and the police and bongos, and I don't know what's happening. <laughs> this is killing me. <laughs> Four hours later, <laughs> the book is done. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> This book was horrific. The amount, the the pure amount of smut is just too much. <laughs> However, I could skip it. It was fine. But the thing with Tessa Bailey's writing is that the second the smut scenes start, the characters, as I said, specifically the male characters, completely switch into new people. And in this case, he turned into like a toxic obsessed scary man i also just read a book about like domestic abuse not to be like dark all of a sudden but like that very obsessive toxic love very much felt in here so i like i love how she writes just like witty characters the banter is really great except the second it got a little bit smutty i felt really uncomfortable because it just felt unhealthy and sick so literally if you read this and you just skim the smut like you start to see signs and you just it's good but whoa i that was worse than either of the two tessa bailey books i have read thus far this one the smut was like downright uncomfortable and like i know i'm smiling but like it did not it did not feel good 
It also wasn't super Christmassy until we got to like the snowball fight. Am I gonna do a scale? I don't, so like on a scale of one to 10, in terms of holiday vibes, I would give it like a four. And I thought that like the breakups and the crises that they're going through were absolutely not believable whatsoever. Like these are adults, they are 30 years old and they do not know. So it was just very dumb. There was so much that I did like about it and I did tear up a little bit, but not as much. At the end, I didn't cry as much as I usually do with like a rom-com because again, just any kind of love confession was just kind of borderline toxic and obsessive. So I'm gonna say Wreck the Halls was a rocky start, but we're done with holiday book one. Um, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Um, it's the next day. The more that I think about that book, Wreck the Halls, the more that I dislike it. I really did not like the romance. I thought just like the, <clears throat> like I said, like the banter, the little quips, just the jokes were quite funny, especially in the beginning. But really the second it took a turn for like the sex scenes, which happened at like 40% of the book, honestly, maybe, maybe closer to like 46 closer to 50 but still it just felt really toxic and it also felt honestly like very male centered because it's mentioned in the beginning our female character melody it's mentioned that she has like pretty severe social anxiety um she doesn't like to be in situations where there's a lot of people and she suddenly is okay with being in like huge crowds and having like millions of people watch her which you could argue is like it's because they're together and she feels safe with him but i just don't the way that her social anxiety was introduced you thought it was going to be a big plot point and then it was kind of dropped and then also like she talks about her intimacy issues as well and how she doesn't feel safe like completely losing control with someone but really like the whole book was just centered on him and his intimacy issues i don't know it just felt really like really really beat centered and the fact that she used his name to talk about meeting they're meeting each other like thrust for thrust but they say beat for beat and i was like tessa that is sick and twisted and i don't support it so yeah i think like the the more that i think about it the more that i'm like really not not a fan i had fun reading it like you saw me giggling quite a bit um so i just i love some portions of her writing but the second she writes a sex scene i hate it so now what do i have should i read the plate before the plate before christmas let's see what that's about because i have that on kindle unlimited it's a dual pov we love it okay this has a 4.3 star rating on goodreads so it says when mom insisted that we all gather at my grandparents ancient cabin for an old school family christmas i fully intended to get into the full holiday spirit with the help of the three wise men johnny walker jack daniels and jim bean but those boys did absolutely nothing to offset the shock or temper or temper the sting of seeing my ex on our doorstep the first day of our holiday soiree. Apparently, Santa missed the memo. Fa la 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 la, fuck my life. <laughs> Off we go. Hi there. So 20% update. I completely forgot. I actually have a class, an online class today. So um, I'm going to be taking a quick reading break but i'm only at 18 percent. i'm not gonna pass judgment on this book quite yet because we've literally just like met the characters seen the lay of the land but we essentially have our girl who has gone through a really rough couple of weeks her car dies she breaks up with her boyfriend who she didn't really like but like eh. she didn't get her promotion that she was totally qualified for she broke her toe she's just having a rough time so she goes to christmas with her family and her brother is like hey one of my co that I really love is gonna be alone this Christmas and like I just can't do that so I invited him and so it's like this packed house it's her and her sister and her sister's husband and kids and her brother and his wife and his kids and now this new guy who of course is an ex-boyfriend that she dated for eight months in college and like totally was in love with and is like the only boy who's ever broken her heart turns out from his POV we know that he knew who she was and so he kind of planned this 
So I don't love that. Like I don't love that setup. I find that that's a little creepy. I do always enjoy the trope of like a family or like a friend group kind of closing ranks and like actively hating this guy. Like immediately all the women are like, oh, oh, you don't like him, Whitney? He's dead to us. And like, he should be scared for his life kind of thing. Um, so I do like that, but overall, like, the humor is just a little, like, it's very, I could see this as a Hallmark movie, like, it's very bland white people humor. I don't know how else to explain that. It's not hitting just yet, but maybe it will. I'm giving it a shot. There's also a lot of talk about, like, getting married and having babies and, like, the biological ticking clock to like have kids and whatever she's 38 so i'm not i'm not sure i love that vein of the story either but here we here we go you know what i'm on page 63 i'll talk to you later okay i don't know now the older sister has a issue because her and her husband like aren't as active or like as just crazy in love as they were before they had two kids and we get like many pages of Whitney telling us about how like you need to make your man feel like a man and like if you're emasculating him with your jokes or you aren't treating him like a man he's not gonna act like it I don't know it's just kind of weird I'm not sure I love the philosophy the worldviews expressed here I have a feeling that at the end of this book she's gonna suddenly be like I want to try for a baby and they're gonna make a lot there's gonna be like an epilogue and she's gonna have a baby at 38 and she will feel like a full woman and I don't want to read that. Yeah, try to concentrate on his needs. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm literally just finishing this book. I'm pushing through for you guys, but I would have set this down 20 pages ago. Yeah, I'm not feeling this i'm at 60 percent. nothing has happened there have been flashbacks to their relationship that have just been them being really horrible to each other and then they just had the old evil spinster aunt who never got married or had children came to visit them and like she was like really rude like she is just a not nice woman they like made a whole joke of tag teaming her and like intentionally bullying her and she's like clearly a sad fucking old woman i don't know this book is really really not good i do not know how it got the the amount of ratings that it got on goodreads i'm gonna finish it but like ugh. it's another morning i feel like this is turning me into scrooge i was so mad last night reading this book so the plight before christmas i told you everything like it's basically about this older woman who is just like nothing is going right in her life and then her ex-boyfriend from college who was like the one and broke her heart shows up things that i wrote down first of all eli the ex-boyfriend he is constantly eavesdropping he like even when conversations become like clearly not for his ears and like really sensitive he will eavesdrop and then he will reference them like he will let people know that he's been eavesdropping also it's dual pov but i was so confused constantly by who was talking because they sound exactly the same i think each pov was technically supposed to be in first person but then sometimes she would switch to third person but then sometimes whitney would reference herself as whitney so she'd be like i found out what whitney wants and whitney wants eli so i'm like who Mm. So that was really confusing. My next note is a spoiler and then my final note is just no. I This book wasn't funny. I guess you could say that it was realistic because characters were like going through these like marital issues. There's like this time where your marriage can hit a bump and both of her older siblings, their marriages have hit bumps. And so like that's kind of, I guess, realistic. But if you don't want to know the spoiler, of like why was he so agitated was it because this isn't a spoiler but like both of his parents passed away at the same time when he was 19 is it because he's an orphan they keep saying he's an orphan so it was his bad mood because he was newly orphaned or was it something else if you don't want to know you can skip here 
where I will hopefully be reading a good book. This is at like the 80, maybe 85% point, right? So we've got like no time left in this book. He lets us know, he lets Whitney know they're finally having their heart to heart. He had leukemia as a kid. So when he was 11 until he was like 19, he had leukemia and so he lived in LA and that's the reason why they even moved to North Carolina, which is where this all takes place, is because he found like this new treatment. I guess his leukemia made his mom drink and his parents constantly fought. When they're about to have the meeting with the doctor, his mom isn't there because she's at the bar. So his dad leaves the hospital to go pick her up from the bar and they must have had some kind of fight in the car while they're driving back and they had a horrible accident and they died. And so they never found out that their son was in remission from leukemia, which is like what their whole life was about for like almost a decade. And so that's why he was like kind of cagey with her is because like, I would say losing both of your parents in a horrific accident is enough. Um, but he also just like felt really weak. And the reason why he didn't sleep with her early is because he had some issues getting it up because of, you know, the treatments. And instead of just like talking to her about it, he wanted to hide that from her. I don't know, his, his, res it was so bizarre. And like, he was just like a kind of mean guy. And it doesn't excuse how Whitney treated him either. Like she was also not very nice. And in the end he broke it off because he didn't think he could be the man that she needed. And then like somehow in that amount of time from being in remission from leukemia until two years later, he's somehow a record-breaking track star. I felt like we could have left cancer out of this. <laughs> like what? It was so bizarre. And then she was like, oh my god, it all clicks and you would have been enough and like let's get married and they get married. Luckily they didn't throw in a pregnancy at the end because that would have been the final nail in the coffin for me. But yeah, I just don't know what I read. Like it didn't, the beginning felt Christmassy so I will give it like a seven out of 10 for Christmas spirit because they were like all home for Christmas and like they had a gingerbread making contest and like a secret Santa and like Christmas karaoke. So like the beginning felt very Christmassy, but then it just got like really bad. Like everyone was unhappy. Everyone was fighting. Why did we have to throw in? There's this whole thread in the book about how the nine year old niece got her first period and like why is that mentioned? It has no point to the plot, but it's mentioned many times. And I just don't know why. I think she was trying to say like, oh, she's hormonal. She's, you know, really annoying. But like, you can be a really annoying nine-year-old. It was so bizarre. And I did not enjoy a single second of this book. So The Plight Before Christmas is officially the worst so far. I'm gonna rank them at the end. I'll tell you which one you should read, but I would avoid this like the plague. I looked at the books that I have and I was like, you know what? I need to read a trope that I like. I, I think I just don't like second chance romances, maybe that's my thing, but I'm going to read Snowed In by Katherine Walsh because it's a completely hilarious fake dating, forced proximity romantic comedy. Let's see. Somehow it is ranked lower on Goodreads than The Plight Before Christmas. Megan is dreading going home for the holidays. She's the village pariah, the she-devil who left the local golden boy Isaac at the altar four years ago and ran away to the big city. Christian's fed up on being on his own every Christmas. He doesn't mind being alone, but he hates his family's sad eyes and soft tones as they sit around coupled up because he's actually totally fine. So when Megan literally bumps into Christian in a Dublin pub, does this take place in Ireland? They come up with a pact to see them through the holiday season. They're going to be the very best fake dates for each other ever. But then there's a snowed in cabin and a little Christmas magic. Uh oh, it is a swoon worthy and utterly gorgeous romantic comedy that will make you laugh out loud and fall completely in love this is what I need because I am turning into Scrooge. I'm filming a, another video uh, for Christmas in Korea on my other channel. So we have a long bus ride ahead of us and I'm gonna be sitting in cafes eating Christmas desserts again. So um, let's head out, shall we? Snowed in. <laughs>
I am losing my mind over this book. So why did the that building just make that noise? Did you hear that? Anyway, so um, yeah, I am reading Snowed In and it's so fucking funny. I'm on like, I'm almost at 40% or something like that. Um, it's really funny. The conversations are so good. I was on the bus and I was actively laughing out loud, like shaking, trying not to scare the woman next to me. There's like one phone conversation that she has where she said something, she's talking to her roommate about like a guy that her roommate is seeing. And she says something like, I thought you told me that he blinked funny and I just lost it. Like that was the final straw. And it has just like continued since then. It's been great. And yeah, I just, I really like it so far. This is fantastic. I'm feeling the Christmas spirit again. I'm feeling alive. I also just ate a cronut with a literal Christmas tree on top. So now I'm gonna go get hot chocolate and continue reading, but this has just been, oh, thank you, Catherine Walsh for saving Christmas, truly. Let's go. Hi, we're back home and I lied in my last update. I was more like 30% of the way through. Now I'm 41% and it's really cute. Um, I think that like the reasons why they are fake dating are so silly, but it's still just like adorable so far and I like both of the characters. I don't know, I just love the vibes so far and it is very Christmassy and yeah, there have been many laugh out loud moments so I will continue. <laughs> so good. Everything I wanted, perfect. There wasn't a stupid third act crisis or there was but it wasn't stupid and like it was just so good, so good. I really appreciated that. So. I read Snowed In, but she has another called Holiday Romance, which actually follows um, the main guys in this one, his brother. So we already know based on who came to family Christmas dinner, what happens, but I don't think it spoiled anything really. Um, so I'm gonna read that one, maybe not directly after this because I wanna like spice it up. But Snowden was excellent, I would say. So absolutely Christmas vibes. I would give it like an eight or a nine. Um, it stayed pretty true to Christmas and winter. And then it was just enjoyable. The characters were like healthy, communicative adults. And like the drama wasn't like fake drama and it was just really realistic and sweet and the banter was really on point and I just really liked it guys I really liked it so good on you Catherine Walsh saved Christmas simple and sweet exactly what I wanted now my next one that I have is tis the season for revenge and I already got a warning from someone on Instagram that it is real smutty. The dedication is to all the girls who knew Elle was always too good for Warner. For all the girls who were told they were too much, let him go find less, which I love. And then there's also a playlist, which includes the likes of Maisie Peters, Legally Blonde Musical, Taylor Swift, wham. So, I mean, I'm mentally prepared, I suppose. I also must say that so far, I think all of them, maybe not Wreck the Halls. I don't think Wreck the Halls did, but the other, all the other books, including this one that I've read so far, have had a note from the author in the beginning talking about any triggers, which I think is interesting and nice. Um, so I'm gonna read this tomorrow, but Snowden, thank you, okay? Bye. Hello everyone, long time no update. Um, I took a couple days off because I mentally could not handle <laughs> that many rom-coms and I DNF'd three books. So first off I started Tis the Season for Revenge and the prologue is exactly, or like the first chapter, it is exactly the scene from Legally Blonde where Warner breaks up with L. It just felt more pitiful than Legally Blonde because he's like such a dick. Like at least Warner, when he was dating L, if you have never seen Legally Blonde, you can feel free to skip this. But when Warner was dating L, he actually like, at least from the tiny bits that we saw, seemed to enjoy her company, even though now we know that she was just like a fling. 
like he would show up at the door and like, you know, he would make the, the lowest of effort, right? Wow, you look so beautiful. <laughs> Bar is on the floor, but in this one, the guy is so obviously an asshole, like dripping in asshole. And it just made me immediately, I hate to say this, but like I immediately thought less of the main character because it was like, how is she so blinded by this? The book continued and we saw like more and more of what she did for him. And like immediately they go into really petty revenge stuff. I feel like this is a book that you might enjoy if you recently got broken up with and you are feeling really petty. I feel like you could get into it, but for me it just kind of felt like really childish. And then, so their whole scheme is that they find out that Richard warner okay richard in the book that richard's boss who he's trying he's a lawyer and he's trying to become partner right so his boss who will be the person giving him the title of partner has a thing for little blonde women which our main character happens to be and he swiped right on her on a dating app and so she's going to get a date for the christmas party be on his boss's arm and show up and look Richard in the eye and he'll die of jealousy is what we're trying to do. But I read up until like the first date and it was just a lot of things that aren't my style. Like a lot of things that were said rubbed me the wrong way. Um, and it was also an age gap romance where she's 27, 28, and he's like 42 or something. They like immediately get physical and he kind of seems like an asshole as well. Like, I don't know. I just really did not vibe with a single character in the book and I didn't like where it was going. So I decided to put it down. It also didn't feel Christmassy yet because it was taking place in November. We're building up to the Christmas party, right? So put that down. I picked up another book that was recommended by Oprah. Oprah let me down. Um, it's called A Royal, A Royal Holiday? And nothing wrong with it. It's just not my style. I quickly realized um, it is about a girl who is a stylist and her kind of trainer or her like Obi-Wan. Like, I don't know. Um, what do you call it? Her mentor? Why could I not come up with that? Her mentor is actually the stylist for a duchess in England. And she had to go on like emergency maternity leave or like she's on bed rest. So for the Christmas holidays, she calls this girl to come fill in. And I thought it was gonna be about that girl, but the romance is actually about her mother that she brings along. So it's kind of like about an older single mom. <laughs> so it just like wasn't for me, I literally only read until I, like once I realized that, I was like, yeah, not yet. <laughs> I'm not reading those yet. So if you're looking for that, there you go. Um, and then just today, I really tried. I read Kilt for Christmas, A Kilt for Christmas, and I was really excited because it was said that it was like an opposites attract. It takes place in Scotland. There's a book festival. It all is about books. I made it to about 46% and I realized I wasn't absorbing anything. It also has a fantasy element. Um, so here are my notes because I read this throughout the day. First chapter, I was locked and loaded. I was totally in on our male character. His name is West. He is a literature professor at Berkeley. He decided to escape his life and come to Scotland for the holidays to help his friend at the book festival. He just seemed like a character that I totally understood. Like he was walking and he got kind of scared of the dark. And so he started running and he, when he got to the pub, he was sort of like scared, but also just felt really exhilarated because he was just like, I've missed feeling like he, he felt kind of like magic around and that's why he ran, right? And there's something about feeling like you're running from a ghost that makes you feel like a little kid. And so like those descriptions, and then like right after that, we get a description of like this book club this elderly woman book club that call themselves the book bitches and they're like really funny um and so i loved them but it is so oh and there's a highland cow ghost named clyde so i was pretty much i was like look at this look at yes please and then our main girl works at a bookshop so much to love, right? So this book is like 200 something pages, like 240 pages. I know that I always say that a book is usually too long. This book was way too short. Um, things were happening so fast and like we would just skip 
these large swaths of time and I wouldn't know like what where we were like sometimes they would be having like a dinner conversation and then all of a sudden they're like outside of the house walking home and i'm like when did we leave like when did we eat i don't under what like it was just really like this happened this happened this happened it's also so insta lovey that i felt uncomfortable <laughs> he immediately is in love and i'm sure that i have a feeling that that is linked to the fantasy element but it still felt weird and i don't know beat like just because of how choppy it was i felt like the characters never had like an actually meaningful conversation like they're always just kind of like nipping at each other when like i don't think they ever really had a nice normal human conversation it was just a lot of like your gingerbread house sucks so i pushed through it and then we got to the fantasy element which is like there's a haunted castle like the the scottish legends are true it just was so nonchalant and like oh yeah our housekeeper's a ghost it just didn't have any magic to it because it was just so quick and just so like ah okay Moving on. It was such a bizarre little book. I really, really wanted to like it. And I liked elements like they, there's a lot of quotes about books and about reading that I really liked, but it was just so fast that I felt like it was messing with my concentration <laughs> because I felt like I was missing things. I felt like I wasn't concentrating on the book, but I was. It was just, it had that feeling of like, wow, this is moving so fast and it feels like it's missing a lot. So that was a kilt for Christmas, which was a bummer. So on the bus, I decided to reread Love Light Farms because I read that last year and it still holds up so far. It's still really good. This is a fake dating Christmas tree farm rom-com that if you like the characters in it, there are more books that like follow different couples in the books, um, which I haven't read. I'm like always keeping them for like my next really long flight because I read rom-coms on airplanes. So Lovely Farms follows Estelle and Luca who have been friends for like 10 years. Estelle owns a Christmas tree farm that is really not doing well. When she bought it, she inherited a lot of the owner's debt and there have been all of these like random acts of vandalism that have just cost her so much and she refuses to cut the pay of her two employees so she's just like this is the year like make it or break it so she enters a contest where she could earn a like spotlight feature by one of the biggest social media influencers for like destination holiday travel and she wins but the kicker is when she entered her like story of her Christmas tree farm involves her opening it with the love of her life, her boyfriend, who she doesn't name. And so when she wins, she's like, oh shit, because the influencer is going to come and like interview her and her boyfriend, look at the farm, spend like a week on the farm, right? And she's like, shit, I don't have a boyfriend. And I think she's like in the top three or something. So if they win, they get like $100,000, all this stuff. So it's like, they need this. And then also like all the traffic from being featured, right? So she like considers asking a bunch of people, she gets turned down and the only one she can ask is Luca. And we know from the get go that they like each other, but she just doesn't want to ruin things. Like everyone she's ever loved has left her, you know, classic story. So she just doesn't want to fuck this up. Like Luca is the one, like Luca is her family, right? <sighs> I'm gonna keep reading it, but I just remember enjoying it a lot. And it is very Christmassy. Like she does a really good job of keeping it Christmas through out, which I love. So I'm gonna see if it holds up. I'm only 20% of the way through. Love Light Farms. Here we go. Okay, very quickly checking in while my laundry machine is really noisy in the background as usual. Finished Love Light Farms, to be honest, because it was a reread, I skimmed it a little bit, but it still holds true. It's really corny. Our main character definitely has like the stupid, like, no, you aren't in love with me kind of thing. But there's just so many scenes that are so wholesome. Is it totally unbelievable that they've been friends for a decade and have never acted upon their obvious attraction to each other? I don't think so especially because they're very physical people. Like they're very touchy feely all the time. Um, so it's a little unbelievable, but it just like hit. It just felt really wholesome. Very, very Hallmark 
Um, so I will say like in terms of the actual characters, I felt like they were quite flat. I don't know, like the way that she acts in situations, like when she speaks out loud, she seems a little dumb. <laughs> um, but based on her like actual actions, she seems like a really good character. So it's it's one of those. Very Christmassy feels because it's all Christmas farmy and nice and wonderful. And then next up, um, I have to stay at home because I've gotten out of the habit of reading on my iPad and this current, this book that I'm gonna read is only available on the Libby app. Oh, okay, so why did I open the Kindle app, duh. Oh, is that why? On the cover it says it's a Kobo original is that like a kindle unlimited is that why they don't have it on kindle anyway it's called the mistletoe motive it's got a 3.88 on goodreads but i don't trust goodreads at all it's a slow burn enemies to lovers holiday romance perfect for fans of the hating game and you've got mail which all right he loathes the holidays she loves them she's full of festive cheer he's brimming with bah humbug besides unreasonably seasonable names the only thing jonathan frost and gabrielle di natale have in common is a healthy dose of mutual contempt that and the same place of employment at the city's most beloved independent bookstore Bailey's bookshop. But when the store's owners confess its dire financial state, Jonathan and Gabby discover another unfortunate commonality, the imminent threat of unemployment. It goes on from there. This also says this is a hashtag own voices story for its portrayal of autism by an autistic author. So yeah, I don't know. It's like enemies to lovers and they work in a bookstore. I am so in. Also, there's a Talia Hibbert book. I keep finding once I feel like I'm done with my list of like, this is how many books I'm going to read. Um, I find all these other, there's so many Christmas rom-coms it's just a little obscene okay yeah fine i've heard that she's a little bit smutty but if i can get my hands on this one i'll also read atalia hibbert i've never i still haven't read get a light chloe brown am i gonna be reading christmas rom-coms for the rest of my life okay let's see place hold how long is the wait it says that it's a six week wait but these have been moving really fast so if you have checked out talia hibbert's wrapped in you return it please to the San Diego County Library. Thank you. I'm trying to do my job here. Okay, um, I'm gonna start the mistletoe motive. I'm obviously doing laundry and that's my main thing today. Um, so here we go. <laughs> I love it when characters call other characters like their antagonist or their mortal enemy and stuff like that. So we're on the first page and we're off to a good start. Dead, he's literally just opening boxes of books, but it's like, a very violent but also sexy thing and <laughs> okay again i'm on page two i'm on page two but i have high hopes <laughs> Okay, I'm not sure how much more of this book I'm going to show, but it's very, very predictable, like so incredibly predictable, but it's kind of cute. I'm okay with the, you know, dramatic irony, whatever. It's also really short. I don't know if it's just because I'm reading it on my iPad, but it says it's only 189 pages. Anyway, so yeah, they just found out that they are going to have to uh, sell a hell of a lot of books this Christmas um, in order to keep the bookshop alive. And even if they manage to sell enough, there's a high possibility that one of them is going to be let go. And so they've decided to like, whoever sells the most books wins and um, let the games, let the games begin. She also just recently had like a sexy dream about him in like a Bridgerton-esque setting. And she's very flustered by this. <laughs> So anyway, I continue, this is flying by. Okay, mistletoe motive finished. I will say this was a lot more lusty than I thought it would be. Like she is just out of her mind, insane, filled with lusty thoughts for the whole book. But I did think it was really short. Like literally, if you just want to curl up with a book, like on a lazy, maybe Christmas afternoon, finish it in one sitting, you can do it with this. Um, I think it was, very like I said very predictable any crisis was kind of solved within the same page um but I thought it was cute like it 
it did the job. It didn't actually, strangely enough, it didn't feel super Christmassy, like because everything was kind of moving so quickly, the, the notes of Christmas cheer were very much like she drinks peppermint hot cocoa and it's snowing often. So yeah, it like wasn't a waste of my time, but it was definitely um, nothing new, let's just say. So I would put it at very mid in my ranking but that was the mistletoe motive. Also, I skipped literally the last one and a half chapters because it gets like really smutty really fast. It's also really quick. Like the smut is there, but like the scene is not drawn out. And yeah, so it was just like filled with a lot of unexpected things, but overall it was fine. Um, and that was the mistletoe motive. So moving on to what are my next ones? I have Holiday Romance, which is by the same author as Snowed In, and I am, I have such high hopes for that one because I loved Snowed In. And also please go follow the author on Instagram because the way that she speaks, like in her stories is how she writes. Like she just is that funny all the time um, and like over the top dramatic. So give her a follow. And then after that, I'm waiting on like a very merry bromance. I still have a couple to read. So we continue. See you at our next book. Hi, a very quick update. I did not get the books um, on hold in time. And so I started just like dangerously skimming through more options for Christmas romances. And I found three more. I don't think I'm going to read all three, but we have options. And today I'm going to start you are a mean one, Matthew Prince, which is about, I think, a really, really, really rich boy. He bought an island and then he falls in, I don't know, I don't know. But yeah, I've kind of had it with quirky girls, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So I'm gonna read about some boys, all right? Okay, okay, okay. So he is from an incredibly wealthy family. His dad's an investment banker. His mom is a beloved best-selling author and he spent millions of dollars buying an island just to like be a pest and so they cut him off he has no money and he is being sent to his grandmother's to live in a small town and think about his choices and so i guess that's where we're going from here i love that we are supposed to know that we immediately dislike this character because she hates used books <laughs> Okay, we're only 30 pages in. Our main character is so over the top dramatic. It's kind of getting old. Like I'm ready for him to have some character development. Like we get that he's rich and spoiled. I would like to move on, but like what? He, um, his grandma is letting one of her, or grandpa is letting one of his students stay with them for the holidays um, because of scholarship issues, whatever and um they have to share bunk beds <laughs> what okay they're starting to be friends and the guy who snores bought the breathe right strips as a gift and then in case they don't work he also bought him earplugs <laughs> the book has been finished it was cute um the main character is a little much like I would have actually enjoyed a dual POV a little bit just so we could get out of his mind for a bit because it was just a lot of like rich kid suffering. <laughs> um, but it was fine. I will say though that how do I search within the book? This was like a joke in the book how many times one of the characters said dude but like it was so much. How many times did they say? 74 times in this book dude <laughs> was said it was a lot i could have used a couple less dudes but overall it was cute he was a little insufferable for a lot of the time but you could see the growth and i think yeah i think it was cute and it was quite christmasy because they are working together to make a christmas gala or what have you so there you go um, next up, I will be reading The Holiday Trap. How long is this one? 428 pages. Oh no, that's a, that's a long one. I'm definitely not reading this tonight, but that's what's next. I would say, yeah, that, that was a fine one. There were definitely like large swaths of it that I was sort of like, it dragged, 
but I think it talks about anxiety disorders, living up to expectations of people, caring about what people think of you. It was just, it just did, it just did the thing. It did what it was supposed to be. It was a cute little rom-com, little small town romance. What can I say? All right, um, I'm gonna go jump around and get my blood pumping again because I have been sitting here reading for a very long time. So catch you next time. So we had just finished You're a Mean One and I said I wasn't going to, my voice is gone by the way, I just got coffee with a friend so we were chatting. So I said I wasn't going to start the holiday trap um, but I ended up having a kind of late night. I wasn't able to concentrate on the other book that I'm reading and I was like, you know what? Let's give this one a try. I'm gonna read The Holiday Trap. I am 40% through. I'm on page 160. I'm on chapter 12. I really like this book. So this is a dual POV. I wouldn't call it fully a comedy. Um, I think this is just kind of just a romance. We follow Greta who her family pulls some prank that is kind of like the last straw for her. It's low-key homophobic. Greta is out to her family as a lesbian but her family like her older sister pulls this kind of prank that she basically volunteers Greta to be a part of the holiday drive where people can like, she's part of an auction where people can bid to date her. Obviously, it's mostly men who are bidding on her and she's incredibly uncomfortable with this. She's like, I'd be uncomfortable even if women were bidding on me. Like, you know that I wouldn't want this. So she's like, I need to get away from my incredibly toxic family. Greta lives in Maine. Then we have Truman who lives in New Orleans and he has had this horrible thing happen to him in his long-term relationship that he is also like, gotta get the fuck out of Dodge. So they happen to have a mutual friend named Ramona and they're both texting her like, my life sucks, I have to leave. And Ramona is like, perfect, house swap. So Truman goes to Greta's house in Maine and takes care of her plants for a month. They're going for all of December and Greta goes to Truman's house in New Orleans and takes care of his giant ass dog and it just goes on from there. So far I'm really liking it. I think that Truman hasn't had quite as much time as Greta has in terms of POV but um, they're both just really cute heartwarming characters and Greta's storyline is just filled with really interesting beautiful women um, so I'm just incredible I'm just enjoying that so much um, and there's one character in here who's like the old wise woman of New Orleans and she just drops that's why I'm kind of saying this isn't a rom-com I wouldn't call it comedy because she drops these like really wonderful lines about getting older and like understanding yourself and stuff like that it's actually like as much as it's just like a cute little romance romp <laughs> it's also got like a lot of really great things about like knowing yourself giving yourselves opportunities to make mistakes finding what actually makes you happy and yeah it's just cute and i think truman's story is quite interesting as well and i think i know where it's going but i'm not positive yeah i will say something that's quite interesting is that when i read kind of heteronormative or whatever stories rom-coms like i said with a couple of these i feel like the characters never actually have a serious conversation they're just kind of like joking with each other and then all of a sudden they're like in love or in lust but i find that when we're reading stories about a gay character about a lesbian relationship the characters will like pretty immediately go into like really deep soul connecting conversations and I just find that I feel so much more comfortable with those relationships because I'm like yeah they actually like kind of get each other and share more than just like a physical attraction yeah I don't know why like I think it was just because Matthew Prince and this one they both had like these quite deep conversations versus like the past couple ones I've read did not but yeah so so far this I'm like I said I'm only 40% of the way through I will rank this really high but it gets minus points for there being zero holiday stuff Greta is piecing out she's not doing Hanukkah with the fam Truman is has made no mention of Christmas he doesn't give a shit it hasn't been holiday e at all but perhaps that will change as we get closer to the holiday season I don't know but so far so good so I will update you probably when I finish it, honestly, which will be tonight. <laughs> so, okay, see ya.
update time everyone i look like i'm wearing blush but it's just i went from very cold to very hot and this is what we're getting so i just finished the book and i think i talked to you when i was at 40 percent i got to about 60 percent and like i said i was loving this book i got to about 60 percent and i realized that nothing was happening i would have loved for these to be two separate books because we had greta's love story that is totally disconnected from truman's love story it just felt like i was reading two books in one and it ended up feeling really long and then honestly greta's girlfriend got really toxic there was a point where they have their like fight and it's supposed to be framed as like her girlfriend is so wise and like helping Greta get out of her kind of like people pleasing ways but honestly if anyone ever talked to me like that I don't think I could ever talk to them again she was so so rude and like demanding an apology out of Greta just because Greta like didn't do something that she asked which was like a very normal human thing to do like basically they had a party and her girlfriend got really drunk and as she's like drunkenly falling asleep Greta is like hey don't worry about it like I'm I'll clean up the party like they trashed the house so she's like don't worry I'll clean up and her girlfriend's like no no don't I just need to sleep so Greta is like okay and then like still cleans up the house and this girlfriend explodes on her like you like disrespected me I told you what I want like what the it was when I read that I was already kind of really bored with their storyline but when I read that I was like Greta get out of the house like this was just a weird their whole relationship was supposedly framed as like Greta being nurtured by all of these wise women and honestly it was just like a different kind of toxicity like her family was really toxic and trying to control Greta but these women as well well specifically the girlfriend I think Muriel was really cool but the girlfriend was also being like like you're people pleasing you have to stop doing this you have to start doing this and it was just really bizarre at the end of the fight like the girlfriend didn't even say sorry she was just like yeah How's that for free therapy? So I ended up actually really hating Greta's storyline because I did not think that that was a good environment for her. I'm glad that she, well, I don't want to spoil it, but. And then I thought that Truman's storyline was super cute, but like we, I felt like we didn't get any of that. Like his storyline felt so much smaller and honestly a little weird. Like the ending, not like the romance part, but there's like another vein of the story that ends. Um, and it's really bizarre how that ends. So overall, this was not a holiday book in any way, shape, or form. It was just a house swap romance that was really two completely separate romances and one of them I really didn't like and one of them didn't give me the amount that I wanted to know or like the amount of time I wanted to have with those characters so I'm really upset because I thought that this was going to be ranked really really high and honestly it just kind of made me feel really uncomfortable towards like the 60 to 7 like by the 70 percent mark I was like fuck this girlfriend so what a what the heck what the heck we have two more left we have meet me under the mistletoe and we have holiday romance I'm gonna read meet me under the mistletoe first in case it's bad so that we can end on a high note because i know i'm gonna love holiday romance or i'd, I'd better <laughs> so anyway that was the holiday trap let me know your thoughts because i feel really conflicted i loved the beginning that was the holiday trap <laughs> i will see you guys tomorrow <laughs> hi everyone i need to check in because i am on the last book of this marathon i never want to read another christmas rom-com let's quickly talk about meet me under the mistletoe i dnf'd it i got to about 50 percent and then i skimmed to about 60 percent and i mean like barely read it first of all not a comedy was not a rom-com second of all it was very much like so basically we have this girl who has this big group of friends that they love to get together for Christmas. They kind of, they they were friends at boarding school and then they kind of all lost contact, but then there was this tragic death. One of their friends died and after the funeral, they all kind of stayed in touch. And yeah, every Christmas they have this big house party because they're all filthy stinking rich, except for our main girl. 
of course, who's like a scholarship student rubbing her pennies together, you know? It just so happens that the place that they go is in her hometown. And when she arrives, her like brother's old friend is the gardener there. And of course, they flirt or whatever. So here's the thing. Here's the reason why I stopped. There are so many reasons why I stopped this. So number one, first and foremost, not a comedy. It wasn't funny. Number two, it was a, it was one of those stories of like grown ass woman has a group of friends that are all assholes and she doesn't realize it. One of her friends cheated with her. She didn't know that he was married. And this isn't a spoiler. This is like set up in the very beginning. Um, at the funeral, they were all staying together and like because of grief or whatever, she and one of her guy friends ended up hooking up and afterwards she comes down the next day for breakfast and all of her friends tell her that he's married with children now. And so first of all, the guy is an asshole, but also all of her friends, like what? So it was just like from the get go, I didn't like the friends and I didn't even really like the girl. Like, I don't know. And then the flirting, the chemistry, it was all really bad. So I do not recommend Meet Me Under the Mistletoe. There was also like zero holiday stuff going on. It was just a lot of like, do we tell his wife that you slept with him and he's cheated on her many times, even though she seems like the most lovely woman. Mm, mm, it was just, mm. So I started Holiday Romance and the reason I'm talking to you now is because I am already 10% of the way through. I'm eating this up just like I did snowed in. Um, loving it. This time we're following Molly and Andrew's story. So this comes before snowed in. If you don't wanna spoil holiday romance, read this one first. Um, but I already know what happens to Andrew and Molly. And um, basically Molly and Andrew are both from Ireland and they're both now living in Chicago. They met because they had a mutual friend, his girlfriend, her kind of college roommate that just became a friend. And she was evil and broke his heart and she got rid of her friend because of that. Um, but for some reason they always end up on the same flight home for the holidays for like the past 10 years. And so they've kept up this kind of friendship. They've always just really hit it off. And even though they live in the same city, they like never see each other except for when they're flying home for the holidays. So they have like seven hours on a plane to chat and then they never see each other for another year. So far it's really good. It's just like a classic rom-com. She hates the holidays. He is like overly in love with the holidays. So yeah, I'm really hoping that this one pulls through. I've got my tea. I've got my Christmas candle. Let's go back. A lot of this takes place at Chicago O'Hare. So let's go back to the airport and here we go. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so their flight is canceled and everyone's freaking out. And this guy is like, oh my Catherine Walsh is my Mrs. Claus. She has saved Christmas this year, truly. I am 30% of the way through. I will say though, I like last week, literally a few days ago, booked a last minute Christmas flight home and I don't book flights last minute. Um, and so I'm already a nervous flyer. Flying around the holidays makes me really anxious. And this entire book is about trying to get to Ireland. There's like this huge storm over the Atlantic, over like Northern Atlantic. So any flight going from the US to Europe is canceled. So now they're doing this like insane round the world trip. And it is, it's like amazing. And I totally would be Molly, like Molly's my girl. She is solving all these problems. I absolutely would be her in this situation, but I would hate to be her. So I'm just reading this, losing my mind a little bit, wishing that I wasn't getting on a flight next week after reading this. Um, but just, it's so good guys. It's, I'm only a hundred pages in. It's good. 
it's good and like the romance isn't hitting yet like they had a moment and that like sent her into a whole spiral but like they're they're clearly just really good friends and it isn't about tension it's just about her really wanting to get him home to his family for christmas because it's so important to him and guys it's just really good and it's the first day of that time of the month so i'm like really real emotion real emotion right now <sighs> Hi, mini spoiler, I'm sorry, please plug your ears for a second. I will put a little title page up when it's safe to look and I will give you an announcement. So I don't know how you can avoid this spoiler. It's not a real spoiler, but it's just really funny. <laughs> I'm dying, her sister's going into labor. I'm sorry that this is a spoiler, but I'm dead. <laughs> You're safe. Thank you for having that moment with me. <laughs> There was just like the sweetest romantic confession ever and I'm in tears and then I read this. <laughs> Hi everyone. When did I start this horrible experiment? This has been weeks. This has been weeks of my life devoted to this project. I'm so happy to be done, but I think the best was saved for last. I don't know if it's just because I'm hormonal, but that was just <laughs> perfect. Oh my God, I teared up like many times. It wasn't smutty, but the steamy scenes were good. It was just about two people who got each other. I'm not gonna cry. Okay, I am actually crying. There are tears coming out. Okay, stop. So I'm gonna give you the final ranking. I have color-coded them, starting with my didn't get to have no rating, which is a very merry bromance. It just never came in to the library. Same with wrapped up in you. Just not available. Didn't have time. I will also give a shout out to Kiss Her Once For Me, which I read either last year or the year prior, whenever it came out. I remember not loving it, but I do remember liking the setup. Honorable mentions. There you go. Now for the DNFs, the ones I did not finish, okay? Most recently, Meet Me Under the Mistletoe. A bunch of unlikable people. Not a single likable human, except for Andrew, who ran the bookstore. Tis the Season for Revenge, literally only read like two chapters of it, sorry guys. Royal Holiday, just not my <laughs> subgenre. I don't know. <laughs> um, and then A Kilt for Christmas, boring, paced strangely. Bonus points though for the ghost cow. All right, now, of the books that I read from front to back in their entirety, worst books this is out of one two three, eight out of eight books coming in at number eight worst book the plight before christmas yuck had like weird trad wife vibes toxic weird no thank you uh next up is the holiday trap very low because i liked it so damn much in the beginning and then it got really bad and i hate the girlfriend and the couple that I wanted to know more about had the least amount of screen time and it was not holiday-y whatsoever. The Holiday Trap. After that is Wreck the Halls because Wreck the Halls at least had me laughing out loud for a little bit. I was giggling so much and then it got weird and obsessive and very smutty with horrible bedroom talk and yeah it just it just kind of made no sense it also wasn't very holiday-esque um but also laughed out loud so we're getting we're getting to the good ones these these two were kind of tied because they were just like mm, forgettable but they did the job and they were Christmassy and that is the mistletoe motive bookstores enemies to lovers <sighs> that's kind of it um, very short, incredibly short book, I must say. Um, but it had everything I kind of needed, and because it was really quick, I didn't get bored, <laughs> and it made me laugh. It all took place in a bookstore, so 
great. Tied with that is, you're a mean one, Matthew Prince. Eat the rich, including Matthew. But it gave me some giggles. It was holiday-esque. It was a cute little romance. They actually talked to each other in a non-toxic way. Yeah, I learned some, I learned some good comebacks. They're quite sassy with each other, and I took notes. After that, we have a reread, which is Love Light Farms, which was just classic rom-com. They're not childhood friends, but they're just like long-term friends to lovers. It takes place on a Christmas tree farm. Everyone is just kind of lovable and adorable. Some complaints because I feel like the dirty talk was like a little gross, but um, that's just me. I have very, I'm very sensitive <laughs> to bad dirty talk. Coming in, number two, snowed in. So funny funny. This one's stupid. This one is like fake dating, funny times, just like silly dumb, especially our main character is just kind of like wackadoodle. Like she's just funny, off the rails kind of gal. Love. Coming in at number one, however, is the first book. So Snowed In is the sequel, companion, following a different brother. Um to the first book, which is Holiday Romance, which I just finished, which is like, again, longtime friends to lovers. They're just desperately trying to get home for Christmas. Zoe, who is a character in both books, she is the sister of Molly, and she is just the best character on earth, uh, on page. I love her so much. So Zoe was present. I was very happy for that. Um, just like laugh out loud, but feel good. And then the conflict was like, not even like it was a real conflict, but like it wasn't stupid. And just my little heart, my little heart. So there it is, guys. That's my ranking. I'll put it up here. Um, this was an experiment I'm never ever going to do again. That was horrible. I'm really glad that I saved Holiday Romance for last though because I would have been in such a shitty mood, but now I'm like on the verge of tears and I'm so happy. <laughs> so that's that. I would very much like to never read a Christmas rom-com again and I hope that you find joy in any of these books. <laughs> And I will see you guys next time. I'm I'm delirious, so I'm gonna go. Guys, don't do this to yourselves. Next time I question whether or not this is a real job, being a full-time booktuber, I'm gonna look back at this video and show people. Yeah, I suffer. <laughs> I work hard, okay? Um, I wish you a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, enjoy. I, I gotta go, but I love you all so much and I will see you guys next week for my Christmas gift to you which some of you have already guessed what it is and I cannot wait to see you in the comment section. Love always. <laughs> Bye.